Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to the ESG show. Unless my maths is failing me, I think this is episode 43. Uh, you have to forgive me, I'm not very good at counting beyond 40, but I'm pretty sure this is number episode 43. And today we're talking about sustainable value. And I thought I'd get straight into it this morning. And I was doing a little bit of research um, for today's show. And there's a very good um, study produced by Stuart L. Hart and Mark B. Milstein. Um, and what I've done is I've produced a short animation explaining what that is. So I'm going to run that now. Bear with me. It's only just over two minutes in length, but hopefully you'll find it quite a good introduction to, uh, to today's show. Understanding the Sustainability Value Framework by Stuart L. Hart and Mark B. Milstein. This presentation is taken from the website Rostone Operations. They take a holistic view of an organisation and emphasise that sustainability needs to be embedded into an organisation and that it can drive innovation and create competitive advantage. Imagine a grid with four quadrants representing different ways an organisation creates value. The right hand side of the grid represents external factors and the left hand side represents internal and the top half represents future and the bottom half near term. So you get a grid looking like this and I'll explain what each of those little quadrants mean. So the top left refers to internal and external, i.e. innovation and continuing development. The upper right is external and future and focuses on future performance, growth and new markets. The bottom left is internal and near term and focuses on managing costs and risk reduction. And the lower right, external and future, building credibility with external shareholders. Now add sustainability. And the top left, internal and future, well, sustainability can support innovation and create opportunities to reposition business. The upper right, external and future, refers to charting a sustainability vision for the future and communicating it clearly and can, can facilitate competitive imagination, provide guidance on organisation priorities and identify new markets and unmet needs. The bottom left is internal and near term, and you add a sustainability to this, and you get engaging employees to find ways to reduce waste and use resources efficiently, which can significantly lower operating costs, reduce risk, and engage the workforce. And the lower right, external and future, engaging with a value chain to develop product stewardship and extend the life and value of products and services which can enhance reputation and legitimacy, ultimately creating more value. So there's the model. Let's get back to the show. OK, well, I hope you found that um, useful and uh, thank you very much for your uh, um, comment, Miranda. I, I, I do my best. Um, now, on the show joining us today is Bob, Bob Willard. Hello, Bob. How are you today? I'm fantastic. Thanks for the opportunity to be on your show. Well, it's, it's, it's our pleasure and our honour, Bob. And you're, you're, you're dialing in from Canada today, I believe. Yes, I am. OK, well, so Bob, Bob Willard is a sustainability guru. In the last 22 years, he has authored six books, published two white papers, given over 1,700 presentations, and created over a dozen free open source tools for sustainability champions. So, Bob, please tell me about these open source tools for sustainability champions. Ah, so I've, um, as you say, I've, I've written books and I've, a couple of white papers as well. And um, in many cases, I'm talking about the benefits to an organization of doing more on the sustainability front than they're already doing. So what I've done is provided some tools to companies so they can uh, figure that out for themselves. 
uh, what would be relevant in their situation in terms of the benefits, financial benefits especially, of them paying more attention to their social and environmental impacts. So some of the tools help them assess where they are now, self-assess where they are now. Some of the tools help them do some calculations on the business case for doing more than they're already doing. Some of the tools are relevant to organizations that are using sustainable procurement or net zero procurement, and they want to know how to implement that. So uh, they're intended to be used by either organizations or people who are working with organizations to help them on their sustainability journey. Okay, thank you for that. And um, why are they open sourced? <laughs> well, uh, they're not only open source, but they're free. Uh, what, what I find is that um, we, we can't afford the luxury of uh, creating all of these things from scratch ourselves and, and reinventing the wheel on these things. So what I do is I, I get these out there for people to be able to use so that we can deal with some of the problems that are quite urgent and help us move the ball more quickly and scale our efforts uh, so that we can get to where we need to be in time on a lot of these these issues, not the least of which, of course, is climate change. So open source means that I'm providing sort of a, a foundation, a base, a, a master set of um, considerations, and people can pick and choose the ones that are most material to their situation and drill down on those if that's appropriate. Okay, thank you for that. Now, Bob, you recently said purpose drives governance, governance drives everything. Can you explain more? Can you enlighten us? Yeah, I didn't used to feel that way, to tell you the truth. Um, but I'm starting to understand that, my goodness, governance is really, really important. And a lot of what directors and boards pay attention to um, is uh, oversight of the organization to ensure that it's doing what it should be doing. And that relates to purpose. Uh, so far, the purpose of a corporation, if you were in an MBA school in recent years, you'd probably have it drilled into you that the purpose of a company is three words, maximize shareholder wealth. <clears throat> That's it, especially if you're a publicly owned company. What we're finding is that it's more appropriate for the purpose to be maximize stakeholder well-being. The stakeholders, of course, include the shareholders, but they also include their employees, their customers, their community, the environment, society at large, as stakeholders who, whose well-being the company is intended to um, protect as well as enhance. And when a company adopts that kind of purpose, magic happens. They start to pay attention to things that previously they were unaware of or um, deliberately avoiding paying attention to. And they start to position themselves to thrive in an economy which is a decarbonized economy, a circular economy, a more just economy, uh, position themselves to really do well, both now as well in the, as in the future. Okay, well, thank you for that, Bob. Now, and I like the fact that magic happens i'm a fan of magic happening and as if by magic all the way from portugal we're going to bring tito onto the show hello tito how are hello. you today great thank you thank you michael good. good so let me tell you a little bit about tito so tito i'm going to allow you to fix, say your your name in full because i'm going to mess it up Tito the Mio Albernaz. Thank you for that. So Tito has a PhD in um, sustainable value in the tourism sector. Um, he is a researcher, lecturer, and consultant in strategic management of public policies and social entrepreneurship and on impact evaluation. So Tito, please tell me about your PhD in sustainability. Well, very briefly, Michael, my, my scope was to um, research this uh, uh, incredibly complex concept of sustainable value in terms of transactions. So uh, what I did was uh, to research a, a specific sector that has a lot of sustainability challenge, as, you, as we know, uh, tourism, and um, try to understand 
what uh, dimensions of value are at play when you buy a trip, when you buy uh, your your vacations, uh, um, and understand which source, which forms of value are at play, and at the same time study the predictors of value, which are uh, known in many industries as the push and pull factors um, of um, of those choices, of those consumer choices. Uh, of course, sustainable value is, is also uh, the challenge of having uh, intangible forms of value. So a part of the economic value is easy to, to understand and to, to research as, because it has uh, this material uh, side to it, which is money and the financial transaction that is happening. But the other sources or the other forms of value are more tricky to to research, and that's what I try to do uh, in my PhD. Okay, thank you for that, Tita. So your speciality is sustainable tourism. Now, I'm a Brit. Um, Brits have this reputation of inv invading Southern Europe's hotspots every summer, getting drunk, making other Brits feel embarrassed, and then coming <laughs> home and moaning about foreigners. Uh, that seems to be, uh, maybe it's a bit harsh, but that's that reputation anyway, and that's how it seems to me sometimes. But I think, Tito, that the race for profits in the last few decades, the last century, has left something of a scar across some of Europe's most beautiful locations. Yeah. Uh, is that right? Well, it is, and uh, this this brings us to a, a, um, a challenging aspect as well of understanding uh, sectors and understanding uh, systems. The, uh, tourism is a global system. It's not just a local phenomenon, and, and uh, in that sense, it's difficult to to understand and to research. Um, and some of these um, manifestations of of, uh, of um, the system uh, as it um, as it happens in reality, so sort of speak, has consequences. In in, in impact evaluation, we call it negative externalities, uh, ne negative uh, outcomes, and, and so on. In the case of sustainable value, what this means is um, you can transform a community, you can tr transform an ecosystem and um, uh, a destination, let's call it Lisbon or, or Barcelona or Porto. It can happen that uh, over time, um, there is a destructive consequence uh, surrounding a given industry. Uh, and this, of course, brings us to the, the importance of measuring sustainable value to understand, to predict, to uh, try to correct uh, as much as we can um, the, the policies that we put in place so that that destructive phenomenon does not happen. And this of course, uh, as implications uh, for uh, regulations and and segmentation, which is what I focused on my thesis, in terms of optimization, how can we optimize sustainable value? Okay, thank you for that, Tito. Now we come to that part of the show when we took took a look at some stories that have been in the media, and Bob, now. There's a discussion going on in Canada at the moment, and this is a bill called Bill S-285. And when I was researching it, um, I discovered a quote from you about it. So I thought, who better than to talk about this bill and what it means than, than, than you yourself? So uh, please, can you explain to us what, what, what this bill is all about? Well, it really comes back to what we were talking about before, which is the purpose of a corporation. And corporates have been getting away with um, taking a, a pretty hard-nosed view of what their purpose is and very focused, as I've mentioned before, on shareholders rather than stakeholders. This act, which uh, has been in introduced into the Senate of Canada, Canada has a, a parliamentary system similar to the UK, where we have a Senate and we have a House of Commons. Um, our Senate is an unusual place for a bill to start. Usually they start in the House of Commons. But in this particular case, a senator has put forward this bill 
uh, which is going to require all corporations it, that were incorporated at the federal level in Canada to change their purpose and to change their purpose so that it's more inclusive of all stakeholders, multi-stakeholders, rather than just shareholders. Secondly, it's going to require them to report every year on how it's going on their treatment of these stakeholders, their impacts on these stakeholders, including the environment and society at large. And thirdly, it um, holds them accountable for living up to their purpose, which means that they could be exposed to lawsuits by activists if they are not fulfilling their purpose. This is a pretty, uh, <laughs> this is a pretty uh, aggressive uh, bill. Uh, how far it's going to get, I don't know. Uh, the senator that, that brought this in is the same senator that brought in a bill on uh, modern slavery, child labor and, and so on in organizations as well as in their supply chains. And she was able to stick handle that through the Senate and the House of Commons. It took three years, but she was able to get it passed. So she's now got this one and her track record is pretty good on being able to get things through both the Senate and, and the House of Commons. So I have high hopes. And even if it doesn't work the way it's originally drafted, um, it's a strong signal to corporations that the game is up, that this is something which they are now either going to be legally required to do or at least morally required to do, which is to help us with some of the issues that uh, impact um, the environment and impact society. Okay. Uh, thank you for that, Bob. I don't know what it is about you Canadians. Um, we have the... Uh, we, we get a lot of Canadians watching the ESG show. And when I invite people to appear on, on the show, I don't really look at where they're from. I just look at what they've done. And they, oh, they look quite interesting. And then when I do look, it's amazing how frequently they turn out to be from Canada. So I don't know what it is about Canadians, but there seems to be some Canadian connective connection there. Anyway, uh, so Tito, um, I wanted to talk to you about tourism in Portugal for a moment. Now, I went on holiday to Portugal a couple of years ago. I went to Porto, a very beautiful city. And if you don't believe me, here are a couple of holiday snaps to prove it. <laughs> and uh, um, and that last one, I was a bit, a bit disturbed when I saw that one. I've actually gone on a diet since I saw that photograph. But, <laughs> but, 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 but Tito, you, you spotted an article that was saying that it's becoming too expensive to live in Portugal. And I'm guessing that part of the issue is that tourism has pushed up house prices. Is it? I don't know, but um, can you just explain a little bit more about Portugal being coming too expensive to live in? Well, it's not just um, an issue uh, about tourism. It, it has to do with um, our, especially our, our main cities, but not, not only that, even beyond uh, Lisbon and Porto. Uh, Portugal has become... Um, and it always was a very special place to live in. So what we have is a digital age that allows uh, a lot of people around the world to, to move around and to, to live in a, in a different country. And this is interesting as a subject because of the social pressure it creates around housing. And it's not just a question of over tourism, it's, uh, it's way beyond that. And so what happens is we become a global territory. And as we become a global territory, this creates a lot of pressure and a negative externality uh, on people who live uh, and, and live on local wages, much lower local wages. And so the pressure on housing is incredibly harsh and pushes people uh, from the center of, of the city um, to the more peripheral uh, territories. And this, of course, is terrible for tourism because you lose one of the factors that I discovered in my thesis and many other people have discovered in other destinations, which is the concept of authenticity. When you uh, go to a destination you want, to engage in some sort of, uh, some form of uh, authenticity that is, of course, not uh, set in stone. It is uh, always evolving, but it is made from the people that live there. 
And if you if if you go to a destination and all of a sudden uh, everything is catered to visitors instead of being a genuine organic phenomenon that is created by the the community uh, that live there, you may lose that gold that golden treasure called uh, cultural authenticity and so on that is made not just by buildings, by environments, by climates, but it, most especially by people. Uh, and that's one of the challenges that uh, happen in many destinations and that, that, that is happening in Lisbon and Porto right now. Yeah, interesting. I mean, talking about authenticity, I mean, when I was in Porto, I was there for almost a week and and, you know, I didn't bump into Christian, Christian Ronaldo once. So, it, you know, that, that was... <laughs> <laughs> but actually, He's from Madeira. You need to go to Madeira to find him. Yeah, you're, you're, I think you're right. But um, uh, but actually, seriously, um, I mean, I'm a big fan of Venice. I think Venice is the most beautiful city. But the last time I went there, I felt that it had an ever such a slight Disney feel about it because this is not many people that live there now. You know, it's just got this fantastic history. But it just felt ever so slightly that it existed purely for tourism now. And I felt that was a bit of a shame. I don't know whether that was in my head, but that was a, a, a slight sense that I had. Um, but um, but anyhow. OK, well, thank you for that. Um, now, I've got one question, the same question for both of you. And then I'm going to have a chat with you both individually for a few minutes. Um, and the question is, um, what's sustainable value? Can you both define? Sustainable value. Um, Tito, can you have a go at that one? Yeah. Uh, so my 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 focus in uh, around the concept of sustainable value, which is vast and is evolving exponentially um, in liter literature and in applied science, uh, has to do with transactions. And so, sustainable value is a multidimensional form of value. Uh, as much as I could uh, uh, create evidences, um, it has a social, environmental, cultural, economic, and governance uh, for, uh, dimension of value. So it's a quintuple bottom line um, with my, my hat to John Elkington's triple bottom line, but there is more, um, more and more evidence around the cultural uh, importance of value and also the governance uh, importance of value. And so th these uh, five dimensions of value are um, uh, the forms of, uh, of how we attribute value to uh, within a transaction and also between the natural world and the human world. Um, and at the same time, uh, we have factors that uh, allow us to predict uh, these different uh, forms of value, we call them push and pull factors. And sustainable value also needs to be contained within the limits of sustainability. There's the same way that we have just one planet, value is finite, it's, it's not infinite. And so um, in transactions, what we try is to measure how people will attribute value to each transaction that they do. And to give an example, uh, a, a tourist destination, for example, has a market and a non-market um, element to it. For example, uh, Lisbon is a non-market asset, but when we buy uh, our vacations, we are also buying access to this non-market uh, uh, goods, this non-market public good that is uh, uh, the community and the territory and the ecosystem and so on. And so uh, what is very uh, fascinating about it is the, also this, these two um, aspects of the market uh, uh, value and the non-market value um, uh, in terms of, uh, of measuring sustainable value. So more or less, uh, this is my, my definition. Okay, thank you for that. And over to you, Bob. Can you um, give us your definition of sustainable value? Yeah, I'm just going to build on what Tito said and also what uh, you showed at the beginning, the uh, sustainable value little video about Stu Hart and Mark Milstein's definition of sustainable value. 
Uh, I was in a program a few years ago where they uh, talked about that and uh, helped executives see that this that sustainability was a good thing and it would add value in a number of different areas, all four quadrants. Um, so when we think of sustainable value, what we're really talking about is uh, value to whom? Value to whom? Uh, and I think that's an important dimension of, of how we address what this is all about. Um, in sustainable procurement, we talk about making sure we get best value for money, value for money, uh, by acquiring the most sustainable products from the most sustainable suppliers in alignment and in support of our, our the customers, policies, strategies, and strategic goals. Um, so something has value if it's good, if it's got quality to it, quality goods and services, but they're also have attributes that are important to us. They're valuable to us. So if you care about uh, greenhouse gases and so on, the value of getting a product which is energy efficient or uh, low carbon footprint uh, is high. So it's, as Tito said, it's subjective, um, but I think the quality and importance factors are very uh, relevant when we talk about value. If, if you're buying a diamond ring, um, you could get a real diamond ring or you could get a, an artificial diamond. Uh, they look the same, almost the same, um, but you might pay more for uh, a real diamond. Why would you do that? Why would you do that? Well, because the quality is higher and it's important to you to have a real diamond for whatever reason. So if it's important to you and it's good quality, then it has value. And what we're with the word sustainability or sustainable in front of it, the adjective, uh, that allows us to say that some of those attributes are gonna be re related to their uh, environmental and social impacts. Okay, well, thank you for that, Bob. Now, Bob, if you could just stay with us I want to have a chat with you for a few minutes. Okay. Um, you're some, and you know what? We're only four minutes behind schedule, which is a pretty much a record for the ESG show. Um, Bob, you're sometimes called the guru on business value of corporate sustainability strategies. So can you explain a little bit about that? Well, I've spent a lot of time writing, talking, uh, developing tools to help with the business case for paying more attention to sustainability factors than a business might already be doing with their current business model. So I've quantified the seven business case benefits of a triple bottom line using Elkington's, uh, John Elkington's language, terminology. Um, and basically what, the, what it relates to are the two quadrants in the, uh, the uh, sustainable value uh, framework that you showed at the beginning, which are in the bottom right, which is now and uh, saving things, saving money now, as well as the top left, the top right rather, uh, which is making more money. So the seven business case benefits are, you can make more money revenue uh, by uh, being a sustainable company that people are attracted to, as well as producing more sustainable goods and services. And that's where the innovation comes in. So revenue is one of the seven benefits. Being able to save money covers uh, three more benefits, which are uh, saving money on your energy, saving money on your waste costs, and saving money on your water and materials costs. And then there are two other benefits that have to do with people, uh, getting more productivity from your people who are more engaged because they're excited about what the company is doing on issues that are important to them, and also lowering the amount of attrition of your employees who leave your company for a bunch of reasons, but one of them may be that they just aren't in alignment with what you're doing on important things that they care about. The last one is risk avoidance, and that gets into the future part of the quadrant where um, it's pretty clear that we're going in a direction here where your business model needs to be aligned with more of these sustainability factors than perhaps it is to position you to be able to thrive in an economy that's paying more attention to them. So the, the title of my book is The Sustainability Advantage, not the sustainability sacrifice 
A lot of companies think it's going to cost an arm and a leg to do this and it's not worth it, but you get more value by paying attention to it because you make more money, you save more money, you engage your people and you avoid risks. Okay. Thanks for that, Bob. Um, I think that the, uh, the heart and um, Mil Milstein, I, I think it's Milstein, isn't it? Milstein, yeah. is obviously quite important. I was regretting when you were talking that I hadn't taken a screen grab of the last slide on the presentation I did. And I thought about trying to do one, but I've learned the hard way not to try and create an image whilst I'm broadcasting the ESG show live. I came terribly unstuck a couple of weeks ago when I tried to do that. So I would urge people to uh, perhaps have a look at the animation at the beginning of the show. Again, uh, the ESG show, you know, recording of this show um, remains up on LinkedIn indefinitely, really. So you can have a look at that animation. Anyway, um, so what is the business case for sustainability? Well, it's basically what I uh, just described, which is making more money, saving more money, um, energizing your employees and avoiding risk. Those are the four categories. The ability to quantify all of those, put a dollar sign in front of them or a pound sign or a, mon a monetary uh, unit in front of them is really important. Uh, and a lot of the tools that I have uh, are intended to help organizations see where they already are on uh, sustainability uh, impacts and deciding how to justify doing more than they're already doing, which is the business case for doing that. Um, so the business case is really, really good if you take into consideration all of those factors. Unfortunately, most companies think that sustainability needs to be justified just by saving money. And that's important, but it's not enough. You need to be able to show that there are additional revenue streams they can tap into, innovation in the, way, in the area of products and employee engagement and risk avoidance, which also are extremely important in a business environment. Okay, thank you. So that's quite an interesting point, really. So yes, sustainability, you can save money and so on and so forth, but that's not not enough on its own. It's all the, the, the other benefits, the innovation the, um, and, and so on. Okay, can I just also ask you to explain, um, maybe quite briefly, because we're, well, we're, we're only three minutes behind, which is actually quite good, actually. Um, can you, what do you mean by the purchasing powers of customers being a market force? Uh, okay, so <laughs> uh, rightly or wrongly, we have a capitalistic uh, uh, approach to our economy. And in a capitalistic system, uh, capital matters. So if uh, providers of capital like banks and investors um, ask you to do something, then uh, you're more inclined to do it than if a tree hugger asks you to do it. So uh, who asks you is really important. In the case of additional revenue, the people that are asking you are customers. So if your customer says, we want to deal with, su with suppliers who are paying attention to sustainability related issues that we care about, like reducing your greenhouse gases. And we're gonna give you a fair number of points for how well you're doing on that. Then that makes a huge difference. All of a sudden, this matters. It matters in your ability to win the tender and it matters to your customer enough that they assign a lot of points to it. So you're, you're wanting to make sure you get at least as many points as your competitors, if not more. So when you start to, to ask questions about this, it becomes a market force. It becomes a market force that causes your suppliers, companies in your supply chain, to not only pay attention to, but improve in areas that uh, are in desperate need of attention, not the least of which are reducing their greenhouse gases. So it, it's not as if they're being forced by the government to do this. It's not a regulation that's causing them to do this. This is a customer. That's, that's the market. And it's a market force that has been basically untapped. And I think it's high time we, we exploited that because I think it's our best bet to be able to make things happen that uh, desperately need to be happen, happening. Okay, thank you for that, Bob. Um, please, can you come back in a few minutes? Um, we're gonna be I'm gonna be joined by Tito now. Um, got a few questions for you, Tito. And I thought we would kick off with 
sociology? I think you're a sociologist by background. What does sociology got to do with sustainable value? Well, it has a, a, not just sociology, but uh, other social sciences as well. And to, to tap in into something that, that Bob said that's very interesting, uh, other sources of, of value or, or new value streams and not just saving uh, money is all about, um, it, it is what it, my thesis is all about in terms of sustainable value uh, of tourism. Um, and the thing is, when you try to figure out how to optimize, you how to optimize sustainable value for a destination, you are speaking not just as um, it's not not just speaking about value to organizations, but to a whole sector. Uh, this can be national; that it can be uh, a region of the world, or or whatever. But the the thing is. Uh, optimization is all about, um, in the case of tourism, of how we uh, bet on pro-sustainable tourists. And there is this uh, research that I used from, from Spain that created uh, something called sustainable intelligence. And so what we measure is, what they measured and I measured here in Portugal is how uh, sustainable intelligent are uh, tourists um, regarding the this matching game between the push and pull factors and uh, and how they behave as uh, as a tourist, and the, these factors are incredibly important to drive the evolution of a destination. And so, the more we bet on pro sustainable tourists, the better outcomes we have. Uh, uh, for a destination. In the case of Portugal, for example, this is happening all over the country. We win lots uh, of uh, different prizes for sustainable tourism. But in the case of the main cities, much as Venice, Barcelona, London for a, a long time, and Paris, so all the, the main uh, beautiful destinations that we have, uh, not just in Europe, but all over the world, have this enormous pressure um, and that's where this uh, much as in the same sense as Bob said for organizations as sectors, we need to figure out better public policies to bet on these pro sustainable uh, tourists and let this incredible force of ethical uh, consumption uh, drive um, uh, in, a, in, in a way the business case of um, of a destination of a country uh, of an industry okay thank you for that now i've heard you talk about market and non-market value of public goods um can you explain what that means well in, this this brings to brings us to to uh, an important aspect in the academia which ecological economics has a view on it environmental economics has a different uh, view um it, one is more uh, in tune environmental economics to measure uh, these different sources of intangible value uh, as uh, a monetary equivalent so uh, you can measure, of course, the financial aspect of real transactions that, that are going on. But then you want to measure the real value of a good. And to measure the real value of a good, you need to tap into the different dimensions, social, cultural, and so on. And to transform perceptions, how people uh, attribute a given importance to that good, to, uh, namely public goods, um, and uh, try to provide uh, uh, one of the methods that you can use is contingent valuation, and you try to value how much is that worth for, for a community and so forth. Um, ecological, e ecological economics is very and legitimately uh, worried about these kind of approaches because uh, to monetize everything can be used um, in the wrong way uh, uh, to instrumentalize, uh, namely uh, uh, public goods, and, and if you if you do not use it ethically, you can say no. But, uh, communities value 
in this in this form so we can use it commercially because it, it's not valued by by a community by the surrounding community of, the, of that good but to me there is a more important aspect to it which is we need to look at goods and services as non-market and as market and non-market uh, goods and this means for example when you buy a plastic bottle you're not just buying a market good, you are buying also all the consequences of that good in terms of uh, non-market impacts. And so this, uh, this object that we are, uh, that is being trans transactions in terms of uh, supply and demand has a lot of consequences. And that's the non-market part of any good and service. Uh, and in the case, for example, of tourist destinations, it is of vital importance to understand all these non-market the aspects uh, of destinations and when we don't do that we see the result we have learned the le we we have lessons to learn uh, from destinations that still suffer and are trying to recover from going too far into the market aspects and the immediate profits uh, of of exploring these goods, these public goods, destinations, and uh, uh, ignoring the importance of the non-market aspects of, uh, of these goods. Okay, thank you for that. Now, twice already on this show, both you and Bob have referred to John Elkington, um, and he talked about the triple bottom line. And he wrote a book called Cannibals with Forks, which I, I think is probably must reading for people who work in tourism and um, work in sustainability. Um, rather scary title, Cannibals with Forks. Can you talk about how this relates to tourism? Yeah, of course, Michael. Uh, first of all, my, my utmost admiration for, for, uh, for the work of John Elkington and, and the work that Bob is doing followed, following these threads that is so necessary so vital to uh, demonstrate to businesses how this is the it's not just the future it's the present for for someone like me that has worked a lot with uh, entrepreneurs uh, and as a former entrepreneur myself i i believe that this is so obvious the, the these different forms of value and the way that's that we need to incorporate sustainability into any business model uh and, and elkington uh, uh, writes about his his own frustration that uh, the his framework was not enough um, uh, considered as um, a recipe, sort of speak, for uh, business models. Instead of what is many times used for, which is uh, reporting on some sort of uh, uh, positive externality from my business model. So. Uh, it is good news that we have some uh, positive impact in terms of an environment or social or whatever, but that's not what Elkington uh, was uh, or has been talking about all these years, which is to incorporate all these dimensions in our value proposition. So to internalize sustainability instead of being something that uh, indirectly happens negatively and positively but it's not at the core of my business okay thank you for that tito i'm going to call bob back on now um as soon as i can find him there he is um and thank you for your comments by the way dawn if we get a chance we'll have a look at a couple of them just to talk about some of the issues you raised but i think maybe before we get moving um when we spoke on the um, one of the three of us chatted a, a week or so ago. We talked about the difference between value and values. Can you enlighten me about what the difference is? Well, they're closely aligned, but uh, values with the S are, are talking about um, ethics, morality, those kinds of things. Also very, very important. But when we talk about value, we're talking about uh, impacts, we're talking about quality, we're talking about the importance of things. Um, so they're, they're, they're a little bit different. Sometimes they're used interchangeably, but that usually is not helpful. Um, so when we're talking about 
value, um, it comes back to really the, the challenge that Tito is discussing on the social side. Uh, it's easier to quantify um, energy savings, water savings, waste savings, and all that kind of stuff. Put a dollar sign in front of it. That's, the, that's one way of doing the valuation of, of that. When it comes to people, though, impacts on people, impacts on society, uh, much more challenging. Um, so if a company says, well, hey, we give uh, 1% of our, of our profits to charity, so we're okay. You say, oh, yeah? Like, what's that doing? So we need better metrics to be able to assess the impacts of whatever it is an organization is doing on the social side. And there was something called the Impact Management Project a few years ago, um, which took a look at the dimensions, the five dimensions of how we would measure impacts uh, on, on, <coughs> on society or on people. Uh, and they were really helpful. They're, they're hard to quantify, but they asked about what exactly are you doing? So for example, if you're, you're walking by a, a coffee shop and there's a homeless person sitting out in front, on a blanket uh, with a cup, and you put a couple of dollars into the into the cup. Uh, that's one kind of uh, help that you're giving to uh, a homeless person. On the other hand, if you were setting up a school for girls in Africa, uh, for girls who would otherwise not have any access to education, you're staffing the school, you're equipping the school. It's a K to K to twelve school. That's a huge undertaking. It's a lot more than just dropping a couple of bucks into a cup. So how do you compare those two? Well, you ask, what are you doing? And that has to do with the, the quantification. Who are you doing it for? First case, it's one person, one, one um, uh, homeless person. In the other case, it's a whole village and the, the girls in that village and a ripple effect throughout the village. How much are you doing? Uh, so this has to do with the amount that you're contributing as well as the length of time that you're doing it for. The, what is the contribution and is this something which is uniquely yours or are you working with NGOs on this? Is this a, a, col a collaborative effort uh, of a, a bunch of people and you're helping to support that that is being led by others or are you leading it? And that leads to the, the last one, which is risk. What happens if one particular year you can't continue to support this? Then what? What happens to the school? What happens to the girls? What happens to the entire project? Have you set up the pins so that they can do more of this in a self-sufficient way and so on? So it, it gets into the dimensions of how you make darn sure that the impacts that you're doing are going to be scalable and sustainable. And uh, I think uh, rather than just throwing money at things, I think we have to think of those considerations in a lot more thoughtful way than we have. And a lot of the work that Tito is describing helps us do that. Okay, thanks for that. I liked um, Dawn's comment about um, the tourism. <laughs> if, it, if it's trashing the local environment, then it's actually not good for the local community. <laughs> and tourism, I suppose, exists because the local community want to try and bring in revenue. Well, what's the point if it spoils, it spoils the environment? But says an she says it's an extractive business, not regenerative. And I guess that's a good point, isn't it? Um, okay. Um, that's a beautiful, beautiful comment, really. Yeah. <laughs> Very insightful. It kind of sums it all up. Okay. Um, impact valuation. There are five dimensions of impact. What, who, how much, contribution, and risk. Um, do either of you want to come in on that point at all to expand on that? Let me just expand on, on what Bob was saying. Uh, first of all, this is a, a very important framework all around the world. It, it, it's uh, an effort that was made with hundreds and hundreds of, of experts involving more than 50 countries. And um, it, it sort of uh, summed up the best practices, especially in, in impact evaluation, but not, not just impact evaluation. And there is an important concept, uh, or two concepts actually, which is outcomes and contribution. And contribution um, 
uh, is also in in um, in academia known as the counterfactual. And so it, what it means is, if we do not do anything, how will reality be in a certain problem? Very good. If you'll understand the problem, and, and uh, if you look at a problem and you say, if I don't do anything as an entrepreneur, as a public policy, as a company, how will reality be? And the impact and the outcomes, the change that we want to see in the world is the difference between the counterfactual or the contribution, as Bob said, and what we do. And this is my value proposition in terms of uh, environment, social, cultural, whatever uh, dimensions are, are at play. So contribution for me is very important. And the, the impact management project created sort of this um, this framework to qualitatively and, and quantitatively understand performance. And the last two um, try to work out if we are benefiting um, stakeholders or if we are contributing to solutions. And so if we, the goal is to be in this last level in which we can demonstrate that we are contributing uh, uh, to the solution of a problem, to eradicate that problem. Uh, and that's very interesting to, to see um, around the, the IMM framework and how we can work at scale and at depth to solve these um, wicked problems, as, as many call them, uh, and companies. It's not just a public policy issue, not just an NGO issue, not just private companies. It's something that needs to happen um, uh, as a global effort, as a, a uh, aggregated, um, uh, consolidated efforts, and that's what the IMM is uh, very um, pertinently trying to achieve. And it's it's so often overlooked when we talk about sustainability. Very often, sustainability is reducing negative impacts. Um, the Future Fit Business Benchmark, which I helped develop, has things called positive pursuits that it also gives organizations an opportunity to assess and get credit for. And the B Corp certification, the uh, Benefit Corporation uh, B Corp certification, also asks you about your impact business model, which gets at the way in which your company is having a positive impact on people and planet as well. So giving organizations an opportunity to describe and get credit for things that they're doing on the positive impact side, really, really important. And that makes the measurement of all of that and the assessment of all of that and the management of all of that so much more important. Okay, thank you for that. Incidentally, we did a show on B Corps at the beginning of this year, which um, if you go through my LinkedIn page or if you go to YouTube and type ESG show B Corps, it will come up. Um, what I thought we'd do, um, I thought I'd ask you one more question and then give you both a minute um, just to say whatever you want to say, really, but things that we haven't discussed. Um, um, can sustainable value help us to measure, measure and manage the limits to economic endeavours, find unexplored value sources and design better public policies? So can sustainable value help us measure and manage the limits to economic endeavours, do you think? Do you want me to go, Michael? <laughs> please do, please. Well, the, uh, my, um, first of all, I think this needs to be done as Bob so stubbornly and, and, uh, and, so, um, and so well has done over the years at the level of companies. I, I believe there's something more to be done at the level of sectors, or at the level of public policies, because we cannot expect that companies do everything um, by themselves and, and sort of create this, this um, uh, self-regulating uh, phenomenon um, and solve the sustainability problems. This needs to be done at multiple levels. And I think there is this zoom, if you will, this perspective uh, that I try to do in my, my PhD and I see happening 
uh, in other um, in other works as well, which is looking at a sector as a system, as a living system, as a sort of almost like a creature. And right now we have so much ability um, in data science to to see these phenomena as they go, as they happen, not just the picture, but the living movie uh, of, of these sectors and what is what is actually happening. But we are not doing that um, for to understand sustainable level at the sector level. And that's something that I think uh, as a, we, we could call it a barometer, we could call it uh, many different things. But I think companies and public policies need these this kind of, of readings of analysis to want to, to make better decisions and to understand what they need to do um, to correct their purpose, as Bob was saying, to correct their compass, their 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 direction in terms of uh, strategic management. Okay, thank you for that. Look, I'm very conscious that we are pretty much out of time. I thought I would just ask you to one question each, just ask you to answer super quick. But Bob, um, I know you're going to be appearing again on the ESG show next month when we're talking about double materiality. I can't remember what date it is next month, but it's in the diary. Um, but Bob, is there anything today that you feel we should have discussed that we that, that we haven't discussed? Is there any anything else you'd like to bring up um, super fast? <laughs> I'd really like to reinforce what Tito was just saying. The, the, the decision making is going to be so much better when we legitimize whether or not this decision is going to be a more valuable decision for the organization, because it's going to cause us to take into account all factors that are going to be impacted by that decision. So when we talk about uh, sustainable procurement, we talk about getting best value for your money. So it's not only the fact that you're going to get a good price for the, the product, but it's going to be um, a product that aligns with who you are as a company. That, that, that if, you're, if you're really into reducing greenhouse gases and concerned about climate change, you're not going to buy a gas guzzler as a car. So what you're doing is you're aligning what you do with what you care about. What's really important to you? What's your purpose? And it, to me, it's it's a it's a unifying concept to bring all of these purpose, non-monetized, monetized things together as a legitimate lens on decisions as we go into the future. So far, the the lens has been way, way, way too monetized, and now what we need to do is not only look at the financial part, but the non-financial implications of what we're doing and how we're doing it. Really important. And that to me is the power of the word value. It's a it's a it's a paradigm shifter. Yeah. Okay, thank you for that, Bob. Uh, thank you very much. I know you've got a I know you've got a dash. Um, I would have one more question for Tito, but thank you for your time today, Bob. Um, and by the way, I do like that question from Dawn that's just come up. Well not so much a question, but an observation. Uh, organizations are living organisms and have their own collective conscious. I think that would be a theme for an ESG show on its own. Um, Tito, That's very supportive of Tito's you, uh, points. Uh, indeed. Tito, do you have anything to add yourself before we close? Just just to underline this this contribution from, from Dawn, the, the, this uh, understanding and that Bob was saying as well, this understanding of these systems as living organisms, and not by chance, uh, some of these, uh, some of the math that is being used on these algorithms come from biology, come from nature, and that's very interesting. So some of the solutions that we have to better understand these phenomenon come from nature itself, and they help. Uh, she helps, or whatever we want to call it. Um, uh, the way that nature works uh, uh, can allow us to better understand how value is formed um, and to tap into those, those uh, sources of value. And this needs to, to be done at the sector level and the, at the organization level, organizational level um, in, in tune, so to speak, in, in, uh, in, um, in, in sync 
if you will. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much, Tito. Thank you very much, Bob. Bob, look forward to seeing you again next month sometime, whenever, whatever day that is. I can't remember. Double materiality. And Tito, I'd love to get you back on the show again. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Thank you, Michael. And, uh, see you all again soon. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Michael. Pleasure.